Several weeks ago, we began a study together concerning the conversation that happened between two disciples who were on their way to the city of Emmaus. This occurred after Jesus' death. Rumor had it that Jesus had risen from the dead, but by this time, at least at this point, those disciples did not really believe that. So Jesus appears with them as they're walking, and they don't know it's Jesus. He kept, him, he kept his identity from them. Then there was this intriguing verse that basically gave birth to the series of messages. It's Luke 24, 27. Luke writes, And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he, that is Jesus, interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. That verse started us on a journey through the Old Testament looking for Jesus. In other words, the Bible is really about Christ. We don't see him in the way we would anticipate, I suppose, uh, until the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then the rest of the, Old, the New Testament describes for us the life in Jesus Christ, how that should look, and, and different aspects of that, till we get to the end of the Bible, which describes the return of Jesus. But all the Old Testament actually was a picture of Jesus Christ. We saw some of that. For example, when we were looking at the Old Testament account of the bread in the um, wilderness, we saw the manna coming down from heaven. We discovered, Jesus later says, says, he is the bread of life. So the manna pictured Christ in the Old Testament. The same was water from the rock. It was, it was a demonstration that Jesus is the water of life. The wilderness, in the wilderness, the picture, the quotation from the Old Testament Psalms about a cornerstone. Jesus reveals that he was the cornerstone on which the whole thing holds together. We studied some things in the Psalms, like Psalm 22 and 23. Both of those Psalms show us that Jesus is the shepherd of his people. In Psalm 18, we got another look at this idea of a rock where Jesus was a solid foundation on which we can stand. He's, he's our shelter. He is, he is our provision in that sense. Well, today we're going to return to the Psalms and we're going to consider God's revelation of the Son, the Lord Jesus, to the nations. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to, to Psalm 2. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one in the pew rack in front of you. Right about the middle of the Bible is the book of Psalms, and we're in chapter 2. We are going to, as we unpack this powerful, but not necessarily pretty, text, it's probably a little bit different picture than you might think about when you think of Jesus, who he is, and what he accomplished for us. Sometimes it's helpful to give you a little summary of where I'm going, so I want to do that. This is, this is the direction, or this is the essence of what I want to say today. In spite of man's continual attempts to resist God's authority, the Lord has established his Son as Lord over all the peoples of the world, and he calls sinners everywhere to come and embrace Christ now before his wrath is unleashed. So that's essentially what Psalm 2 is about. Obviously, there, there is here a specific application for those who remain outside the faith, but there's also significant area of, er, there are significant areas of application for those who are in Christ Jesus, and I'll make an attempt to highlight some of those as we go. The main points of this I borrowed. Uh, I always try to give credit if I borrow something. Um, one of the commentators, in fact, almost all the commentators that I read over the last few weeks pretty much give the same um, outline to the book of, of to this chapter, second, uh, the second psalm, but I did borrow it from Stephen Lawson in the Holman Commentary series on Psalm 1 through 75. Kids, if you're using your um, activity sheets, um, Today is, is probably the second half of the introduction to the Psalms. The first talked about the blessed man and the wicked man. This Psalm talks about the ultimate blessed man and the ultimate rebellion of the wicked as they continue on a path of unrighteousness. So here's the first question. Here's some of the questions I want you to look for. This one's an easy one. You just have to mark one of two 
possibilities. Um, were these people happy about God's control over them, or were they angry? Second, what, what, uh, or they wanted to be free from God, and they thought they could be free from God. What does Psalm 2 say that God does at their demonstration of trying to break away from God? Who has God set up as the king over the whole earth? The next question, what did God say he would do to those who rebel against him and his son? Here is a hint. He talks about doing something with pottery, all right? So you can look at that one. And then finally, what image did the writer use to describe the kind of relationship we should have with Jesus? He told us to do what toward the son? Four-letter word, real simple. It's at the very end of the psalm, all right? We'll see uh, how well you do. John and uh, Christiane will meet with you at the end of the service back in the corner. See how you do. All right. Let's begin with um, at the at in, with the psalm, and we look at, at the people's insurrection. Here's what's going on. Here's how God describes the world as it is in relation to God. Verse one and one through three. Here it is. Why do the nations rage, and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. In other words, the world looks at God and they say, We don't want to be restrained by the things that God says. We don't want to do the things God tells us to do. We don't want to be under the pressure of saying that we have to give account to somebody else. We want to be free from all of that. That's what this, these people are saying. So let's make some observations about those first three verses. To start with the fury of the rebellion against God in verse 1. Psalm 2 begins with the astonishment of the writer of the futile attempts of the nation to rebel against God. The author, who according to Acts chapter 4 is David, asks the question, why? Why do they do this? That question is answered in the next verse. The people mentioned are against the Lord, and they take up counsel together on ways to overthrow God's sovereign rule. Charles Spurgeon wrote years and years and years ago, we have in these first three verses a description of the hatred of human nature against the Christ of God. Though there's no lack of passion Behind the rebellion, the results will prove to be absolutely empty. The rebellion will come to nothing. The people really do plot in vain. From the beginning, Adam and Eve rebelled against God in a selfish attempt to gain their freedom from God's prohibition. As sinners, we hate being told that what we can't do. You get, notice that? I mean, people, if you say to your kids, you can't do that, what's the first thing you want to do? And adults are just the same. We, we, we're frustrated by authority often. We don't like that. We hate being told what we cannot do. Sadly, what these people in verse 1 thought would set them free actually only condemned them to a lifetime of incarceration. Not only were they affected, but also the whole world was pushed into the worst kind of slavery, a slavery of the soul resulting in, in eternal condemnation. What Adam and Eve and everyone since has failed to, to understand is that freedom without authority is actually anarchy. Everyone does what's right in their own eyes, and when that happens, nobody is free. Authority without freedom, if you have all authority, no freedom, that feels a lot like slavery, but true freedom is actually liberty under authority. Only under God's authority is there true freedom. God offers this true freedom, but people reject it. It's the height of vanity to think that man can be free without God. But that's exactly what you have in Psalm 2, the first three verses. That's the fury of this rebellion against God. They desperately want to break apart away from God. Then the focus of the rebellion, verse 2, we, we shift now from the nations and the peoples to the kings and the world rulers. 
They have throughout history taken their stand against the Lord and counseled among themselves how to overthrow God. There are all kinds of Old Testament pictures along the way that demonstrate such behavior. Perhaps as good as any illustration was the Tower of Babel. Remember that story? Early in the book of Genesis, people gathered together. The reason for coming together and establishing their own worship system, they wanted to create a God and create a worship system that, that replaced the God of the Bible because they didn't want him telling them what to do. They would rather create their own God than they tell him what to do. That's essentially what was taking place. To rebel against God's authority always, always brings confusion and hardship and further loss of freedom. Let's check it out. The features of that rebellion in verse 3, the desire for freedom from all religious restraints along with the desire for freedom to pursue self-instituted, self-indulgent goals fuels that rebellion. Actually, these words from Psalm 2 are quoted all over the Bible. One place they're quoted is in Acts chapter 4, verses 23 to 31. And it's interesting what the writer does, Luke. He takes those words and he applies what was taking place actually to a period of time when Jesus was under, was, came under this um, judgment of Rome. And he actually applies the idea of Herod and Pontius Pilate as people like those kings and rulers who are trying to um, overthrow God. In fact, one writer said the early church saw this psalm as the record of the conspiracy of Herod and Pontius Pilate along with the Gentiles and the Jews against Jesus. They also saw this text as a revelation of the outworking of God's sovereign plan of redemption. We would do well to see this in the same way. So the first scene in the drama is set on earth. The kings and the peoples are plotting a rebellion against God. And as bizarre as that sounds, that's an accurate picture of those who do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Once in a while I've said, and I get into trouble when I say it, but once in a while I, I make the declaration that everybody who is outside of faith in Jesus Christ hates God. Everybody who is outside of Jesus, hates God. And usually the criticism is, wait, 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 wait. I mean, I know lots of people who don't believe in Jesus. They don't hate God. They like God. No, they don't. Because, you see, if we really love God, we would do what he says. If we love God, we would honor his word. If we loved God, we would want to do all that would please him. But the Bible makes it very clear that we who do not belong to the family of God, we who do not um, embrace Jesus as Savior, we are at enmity with God. That means we're at war with Him. We want to do what we want to do. We don't want Him telling us what to do. Ultimately, we hate Him if we're outside of Jesus. Now, that's, again, that comes as a shock to some people, but if you do not belong to Christ, then you really do not love God. You hate Him. I can say that based upon what the scripture says throughout. So that's the first, first part of this psalm. The second part is, that, is God's indignation. How does God respond to those who would try to break apart what they consider to be bonds on them to have to obey him? What does God think about that when people say, we're just going to push God out of the way, we're going to jettison him, we're going to do whatever we want? How does God respond to that? Verses 4 to 6. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Notice how much that is in contrast with here you have the people of the world saying, We don't want this. God is in heaven. He laughs and says, that I have set my king on the holy hill of Zion. He's talking about Jesus. God's laughter is not that of, of uh, ha ha, this is funny. It's not that at all. In fact, there's nothing funny about this at all. It's a laughter of derision and mockery. Then, verse 5, speaks of God as having reached the end of his mercy. This is not a word you want to hear. 
Contrary to what we may think and even have heard others teach, God's mercy is not infinite. Remember when we studied Psalm 23, remember that? And how that ends? How does that end? What follows us? Yeah, it's mercy. For those of us who belong to Jesus, and really, I think really, his mercy continues through all generations. It continues forever for us. But for those outside of Jesus, his mercy has a limit. God's mercy is not infinite. There's a point when God's mercy gives way to God's righteous wrath. For believers, again, we can make the case that his mercy is forever, but that's not true for those who set themselves against the Lord. Does God really scornfully laugh at those who attempt to overthrow him? There's some interesting accounts in history. Um, you remember the Roman Empire. Um, for example, the Roman Emperor Diocletian, who ruled sometime after Jesus, about 245 to 313, believed that he had essentially extinguished the name of Christ. He was, pretty, he was confident that he had totally destroyed Christianity. He had totally destroyed any essence of Jesus Christ in the lives of people. As he extended the Roman Empire westward into Spain, he, he um, erected two monuments. And here are the proclamations on those monuments. It's kind of interesting when an emperor would make a monument the first half of the monument is his name, okay? So it's like Diocletian, Jovian, Maxim, Maximian, Herculeus, Caesarus, Augusti. Okay, that's his name. For having extended the Roman Empire in the east and the west and having extinguished the name of Christians who brought the republic to ruin. The second was much the same, his name and then for having everywhere abolished the superstition of Christ, for having exting, extended the worship of the gods. Now, there's the fist in the air from the early part of the psalm. But it only brings the laughter of God. By the way, Diocletian can only be found in the history books and not much about him. Jesus is the living Lord worshipped all around the world. He who sits in the heavens laughs. Historical record of, of God's response, um, I found this in a commentary at some point about the rulers of this world. 30 Roman emperors, governors of provinces, and others in high office who distinguished themselves by their zeal and bitterness in persecuting the early Christians. Here's an accounting of them. One became speedily deranged after some atrocious cruelty. One was slain by his own son. One became blind. The eyes of one started out of his head. One was drowned. One was strangled. One died in miserable captivity. One fell dead in a manner that will not bear recital. One, di one died of so loathsome a disease that several of his physicians were put to death because they could not abide the stench that filled the room. Two committed suicide. A third attempted it but had to call for help to finish the work. Five were assassinated by their own people or servants. Five others died the most miserable and excruciating deaths, several of them having an untold complication of diseases. Eight were killed in battle or, or after being taken prisoners. Among those were Julian the Apostate. In the days of his prosperity, he is said to have pointed his dagger to heaven, defying the Son of God, whom he commonly called the Galilean. But when he was wounded in battle, he saw that all was over with him. He gathered up his clotted blood, threw it into the air, exclaiming, Thou hast conquered, O thou Galilean. That's a record of those who would hold their fist in the air and basically say, We don't care about God. We don't, we're, 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 we're not interested in God. We are rulers of our own selves. We are, we are the ones who who um, take care of our own fate, we're the ones who are in charge. 
He who sits in the heavens laughs. That scornful laughter of God turns to fury as God speaks in wrath against those who would rebel against him as he, as he establishes his sovereign king, his own son. God will speak to them, I think we could say, in a language that they can understand. The establishment of Jesus as king is on Zion, my holy hill. That's likely a dual reference to both the heavenly city as well as the earthly Jerusalem. In each, the Lord Jesus is established as king. What is God's intention in all this, however? What is his intention? That's revealed to us in verses 7 through 9. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I've begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make a nation, the nations, your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. God establishes his son as Lord and Jesus will rule. And his rule, he will rule because he has a right to rule. He has a right to the throne. Um, In Acts chapter 13, Luke records this. He has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus as also it is written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I've begotten you. So this declarative act was fulfilled in Jesus' resurrection. Sometimes when people see the word begotten, they assume that means means born. That has to do with uh, Jesus was a creation. Nothing could be further from the truth. What Luke is saying is God said those things. The Father says those things about the Son as a result of him coming in the flesh and and then being raised from the dead. That's his reference Same in in, uh, Hebrews chapter 1. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I've begotten you. Or again, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. And chapter 5 of Hebrews, So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said, You are my son, today I have begotten you. In other words, the pronouncements in reference to Jesus as the son and as the begotten of the father were not references to any beginning but of the incarnation and the resurrection. What the Father planned and purposed in eternity past, the Son would proclaim and perform in time and in history, which he has now accomplished. And the effects of that are carried on throughout eternity. In other words, having said all that, Jesus has a right to the throne. Jesus has the right to rule. Furthermore, he has resources to rule. We should compare with Revelation chapter 5. The last book of the Bible says this. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessed, blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, amen. And the elders fell down and worship. That's a scene in heaven. So here's Jesus, the exalted one, and all of them are bowing down to and worshiping. Here in Psalm 1 or Psalm 2, you have these people who are shaking their fists at God. Look at the difference. His resources for the throne recorded for us in Revelation chapter 5. Because of Christ's submission to and fulfillment of the Father's will, God will bestow on him a rich legacy which will include vast inheritance that is being progressively realized. In other words, as more and more embrace the Lord Jesus as Savior and will be fully transferred as he returns in power and great glory to be acknowledged by all. When I read Philippians chapter 2 a little while ago, remember the scene was that everyone will bow before the Lord? Everyone? And so the idea is that whether you shake your fist or embrace Christ by faith, the idea is all will bow before him. Some will bow before him to be exalted, to be with him forever. And some will bow before him recognizing at that point that he was in fact Lord, but they had rejected him and will be cast away an awful picture. Here's his rule. 
from the throne in verse 9. The, notice the sternness and the intensity and the finality of the judgment. Pictured here is absolute sovereignty of God and the inherent weakness and worthlessness of man. Again, in Revelation 19, verse 15, we see a picture of this in his sovereign reign. The writer uh, John writes, For from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. You see the picture from Psalm 2 interjected in Revelation 19? All that the psalmist has recorded establishes God as sovereign over all his universe and Jesus as the anointed king over all. Now finally, what do we do with this? Okay, We have this picture of God being sovereign, people being rebellious, God establishing his, his son as the king of kings and lord of lords, and still people rebelling against that. Every right Jesus has to have the throne to call upon us to worship, all of that. People are shaking their fists. God is laughing in, in scorn at them. So is that where it ends? Well, there's one more thing, and that's the invitation from God. And that's in verses 10 to 12. Here's what the psalmist tells us in terms of God's invitation. Now, therefore, he says, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Now, whether this is the voice of the psalmist or the Holy Spirit, this final speaker extends God's invitation, but also God's warning. And we must consider this. The call for obedience is here. The call for submission to God is here. There, there are really only two possible responses to God, either to rebel or to serve. Not to serve, guess what is, what is that? It's to rebel. Not to serve the Lord is to rebel against him. To rebel results in the wrath of God. To serve opens the way to enjoyment, to happiness, if you will, or blessing from him. In the words of the psalmist, he says, kiss the sun. What in the world does that mean? I'll give you an idea. We kiss the sun when we bow to his will and his way. We, quote, kiss the sun when we willingly submit to his authority by recognizing his lordship over us. We kiss the sun when we love him more than we love ourselves and the cheap substitutes that we so often think will satisfy, but only leave us in greater hunger and thirst. That's the divine call to obedience and submission. And when we obey, when we submit to him, we have the promise of happiness, blessedness. You remember in Psalm 1, when it started out, happy is the man, or blessed is the man, who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, and so forth. Remember that? And then Psalm 2 ends, blessed or happy are all who take refuge in him. Many people think that those two psalms were actually the beginning or the introduction to the whole book of Psalms. And the two psalms really go together. The way of the sinner in chapter 1 is carried to its logical conclusion in cosmic revolt of the nations in chapter 2. The truly righteous man in Psalm 1 is presented explicitly as God's son in chapter 2. All who do not bend the knee to God's son will be forced to bend the knee to God's king. I think it was James Boyce who captured the appropriate conclusion that should help us. Here's what he said. What does this gentle, loving, and tender voice call on those, these rebellious human beings to do? A number of things to be wise, to be warned, to serve the Lord with fear, to rejoice with trembling. But chiefly, they are to kiss the sun in grateful, loving submission. That is what these rulers will not do, of course. It is why they are in danger of a final, fierce destruction. 
Make sure that you are not among them. The rulers of the world rage against Christ. But why should you? The hands he holds forth for you to kiss are the hands that were pierced by the nails when he was crucified in your place. One day he's coming as a great judge of all. On that day, the wicked will be punished. But today is the day of his grace. He invites you to come to him. The final verse said, blessed are all who take refuge in him. It's the remainder, I'm sorry, it's a reminder that the only refuge from the wrath of God is God's mercy unfolded at the cross of Jesus Christ. In history, we learn that in A.D. 360, Flavius Claudius Julianus ascended to the throne of Caesar of Rome and reinstated pagan worship. It had essentially been abolished under Constantine, and now this new emperor comes, and he doesn't want anything to do with Christianity, and so he tries to abolish it completely. Persecution against Christians once again heated up, and in an attempt to entertain some friends, the emperor grabbed a hold of a believer and began to taunt him. The believer's name was Agaton. And so the emperor, to entertain his friends and to mock Christianity, begins to ask him questions, and this was one of the questions. How is your carpenter of Nazareth? Is he finding work these days? To which, without hesitation, Agaton replied, he is perhaps taking time away from building mansions for the faithful to build a coffin for your empire. <laughs> kingdoms have come and kingdoms have gone, but Christ's kingdom has not, nor will it ever fail. God the Father has established his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, on his holy hill in Zion. He will rule in his kingdom will stand forever. I close with a great warning passage from the letter of the Hebrew, to the Hebrews. Listen carefully and perhaps maybe we will respond appropriately. Here's the quote. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all those who take refuge in him. Now, sermons like this are not easy to preach. It's easier to talk about God's grace and God's mercy and God's love and God's provision, and all those things are true when we're in Christ. But the other side of that is that if we do not know Jesus, then judgment is coming, and God will bring that. And all of that judgment that he promises in the scriptures, frankly, all of us deserve. But God in his mercy has extended to us the Lord Jesus Christ who paid the price for us. If we will but trust in him, we will have eternal life. We will be with him. We will, in the words of the psalmist, kiss the son. We will recognize his authority and, as it were, kiss his hand. For he is the Lord of glory. And in him there is joy and there is blessedness and there is life forever. Only in Christ. All those who are outside of Jesus will, in fact, bear the judgment that is due for their sin. That is why we must make the gospel known, even when people would mock us. The world is still shaking their fist at God and saying, that's a bunch of garbage. I'm not going to believe that. I'm going to do my own thing. If there's a God, then I'll take my chances. 
He who sits in the heavens laughs. And judgment will come. But in Christ Jesus, there is hope, there is help, there is salvation, there is life forever. Make it known. And if you don't know that, talk to me. Uh, talk to some people around you that can show you the wonder of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What a gift. What an offer. Let's pray. Father, thank you that we're not just kind of floating around in a sea of it has no authority, no place, it's, it's not going anywhere, nothing's going on. Thank you that you are a sovereign Lord, you control all things. Thank you that we can have life in Jesus. Thank you for the gospel, thank you for the warnings, but also thank you for the promises. Thank you that for the majority of the people in this room, you have called out, you have, you have given them eternal life, you've saved them, and they will in fact know the blessedness of, of being with you for eternity and what a blessed time that will be. But I pray for those who are outside of Christ, who have an enmity against you, Lord Jesus, that, that does not quit, a desire to do their own thing, in their own way, without thought for you. I pray that you would break their heart. I pray that you would open their mind. I pray that you would draw them to yourself, that they would come running to you. Thank you for this little psalm. Thank you for your great grace as you work in us for the glory of Jesus. Thank you in your name.